Um, hey, I wanted to make a video reply to Scott Clark. He is a Bible teacher of sorts, and he's gotten into dispensationalism. I watched uh, his video on Romans 11. He talked about seeing the Gentiles in there as converts to Judaism, Jewish proselytes. And I understand how he gets to where he got in his thinking, but unfortunately, I think he's making a lot out of little things and blowing those things out of proportion. And this is nothing against Scott, of course, but I think uh, just as one brother to another, I thought I'd offer some encouragement and uh, just some, some thinking through this. I'm going to include this little document as a link in the description, the one I'm reading from right now. Uh, so you can see I've, I've got the scriptures, I've got different uh, phrases highlighted in different colors just to make things stand out. So you can even follow along with the link in the description, the document there, if you want to follow along as I'm reading. So anyway, I understand how Scott gets to where he got, but uh, unfortunately I think he's making a lot out of little things, blowing them out of proportion. He said toward the end of the video that Romans 9-11, through 11, even though it's written by Paul, is not written for us today. This is very unfortunate because it reminds me of what a heretic called Martian was doing. It isn't the same, but hear me anyway. Martian thought that the God of the Old Testament was a different God, an evil God. So he rejected the Old Testament and only included Luke's Gospel and Paul's writings in his Bible. But even from these books, Martian cut out various parts, especially quotations from the Old Testament. Here's a quote from another early Christian writing about Martian, and he says, One man perverts the scriptures with his hand. Martian expressly and openly used the knife, not the pen, since he made such an excision of the scriptures as suited his own subject matter. So Martian cut things out of the scripture that he didn't like, things that didn't agree with his theology. This isn't entirely what Scott is doing, of course, but it becomes dangerously close considering he already considers the Old Testament, the Gospels, Acts, and Hebrews to Revelation as not being written to us. This is not at all how the Apostle Paul thought of the scriptures. He freely quotes the Old Testament, he calls it scripture, and uses its text to prove his points. So let's look at these two thoughts that Scott has proposed. The first thought is this question, is Romans 9 through 11 not written to us? And is Romans 9 through 11, and specifically chapter 11, written to Gentile converts to Judaism, Jewish proselytes? Let's look at the context of Romans 8 through 12, chapters 8 and 12 of which Scott says is written to us, and see if anything changes within chapters 9 through 11. Here's a bit from Romans 8. The key word is brothers, and the rest is context, so I'll just read this whole thing. Romans 8, starting in verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are children of God. For you didn't receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So in Romans 8, 12, he calls the people he's speaking to brothers. Scott would say that this is addressed to us today. Toward the end of Romans 8, he uses the words us and we and our, talking about the love of God and of Christ toward us. Here's some more from Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, 
how would he not also, along with him, freely give us all things? Who could bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, even as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from God's love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So those are the last verses of chapter 8. Then, chapter 9, Paul talks about how he wishes that he was accursed so Israel could be saved. But he says, not all Israel is Israel. It's not biological, uh, who Israel is. It has to do with God's promise and choice. Then Paul says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, us, whom he also called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Paul uses the word us again, and this is in chapter 9, talking about how we are one group of people who have been called not only from Jews, but also from Gentiles. Think. If us was referring to Jews and Jewish proselytes, would this make sense? How could a Jew be from the Jews? But instead, Paul says that both Jews and Gentiles were called from being Jews and from being Gentiles. In other words, they become a new group together. And this group is us. Continuing in chapter 9, look at this. Verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, who didn't follow after righteousness, attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, following after a law of righteousness, didn't arrive at the law of righteousness. Why? Because they didn't seek it by faith, but as if it were by works of the law. If these were Gentiles who became Jewish proselytes that Paul was talking about, would he say that they had truly attained to a righteousness which is of faith? I don't think so. In fact, Paul contrasts these Gentiles with the people of Israel. So he wouldn't contrast the Gentiles with the people of Israel if the Gentiles had become Jews, people of, you know, bloodline of Israel. Paul continues this thought at the start of chapter 10. He says, brothers, again, including himself in this, in this collective, Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is for Israel, that they may be saved. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they didn't subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Not everyone who becomes a Jewish proselyte. Paul said just a moment ago that the Gentiles found the righteousness which is of faith, but that the people of Israel tried to find righteousness by works of the law. Here Paul expands and says that Israel sought to establish their own righteousness, but that Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And Paul had just said a moment ago that this is exactly what the Gentiles had done. They had believed. They had faith. In other words, Christ had become the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to the Gentiles. 
They had not become Jewish proselytes. They were true believers in Christ. Now, regarding whether chapters 9 through 11 are written to us, look also at the fact that, just like in chapter 8, which was clearly written to us about the love of God and the love of Christ to us, we have Paul addressing his readers as brothers. So both in chapter 10 and in chapter 8, Paul says, hey brothers, you know, he's including himself in this collective, this new group, not as just Israel, but as the body of Christ. So this text in chapter 10 is also written to us. Continuing in chapter 10, ask yourself, is this written to us? Chapter 10, verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, and is rich to all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I would say this is certainly written to us. In fact, this is the kind of text that Scott would, you know, more than likely use to prove his point that the distinction of Jews and Gentiles in the body of Christ is irrelevant. And here is this thought in Romans 10, which is supposedly not addressed to us, according to Scott. Again, nothing against Scott, I'm just trying to get us thinking about what this really says here. So not only is this so, but this is a very true statement regarding the fact that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Is this talking about Jewish proselytes? Anyone who becomes a Jew will be saved? I don't think so. It says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This sounds much more to me like a statement of being a true believer in Christ. And I think you would probably agree. Notice, by the way, that Paul is proving his point by quoting the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew scriptures. Like I said, Paul has no problem with the Old Testament. He quotes from it quite freely. It was his Bible, and he uses it to prove his new covenant points about the body of Christ and so forth. So here's an interesting bit, continuing in chapter 10. 10 verse uh, 17. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, didn't they hear? Talking about Israel. Uh, yes, most certainly, their sound went out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world, quoting from Psalm 19. But I ask, didn't Israel know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy with that which is no nation. I will make you angry with a nation void of understanding. Deuteronomy 32. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who didn't seek me. I was revealed to those who didn't ask for me. So Paul is still talking about faith. And he's still talking about how the Israelites didn't have faith, but the Gentiles found faith. And look, he says that God was going to provoke the people of Israel to jealousy by another nation, the Gentiles, of course. So did these Gentiles become Jewish proselytes? Do you think the people of Israel would be provoked to jealousy because the Gentiles became Jewish proselytes? I don't think so. On the contrary, the people of Israel would have continued to feel special if Gentiles were becoming Jews. No, the people of Israel was provoked to jealousy because they had lost their favored position. Now Gentiles could come to God without going through the Jewish nation. That's what got them jealous. Everybody can come to God on the basis of faith in Christ. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, now chapter 11. Paul continues his thought, verse 11. I ask then, did they, that is the people of Israel, did they stumble that they might fall? May it never be. But by their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if their fall is the riches of the world and their loss is the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you who are Gentiles, 
Since then, as I am an apostle to Gentiles, I glorify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, the people of Israel, and may save some of them. For if the rejection of them is the reconciling of the world, what would their acceptance be but life from the dead? So Paul says that because Israel didn't have faith, that they had stumbled, salvation, not Jewish proselytism, has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. There is no problem with acknowledging that someone is from a particular nation, like being a Gentile. This doesn't contradict the fact that the person is now a true believer in Christ. I could likewise acknowledge that I have a black brother in Christ, or an Asian brother in Christ, a female brother in Christ, an older brother in Christ. Talking about distinctions on the physical doesn't negate the fact that they are still brothers and sisters in Christ. So both facts are true, their ethnicity and their faith. One fact deals with the physical and one fact deals with the spiritual. It is not as though we lose our eyes when we come to faith in Christ and can no longer see what people look like or what nation they're from. If that were the case, Paul wouldn't be able to make his argument because he would have lost his ability to distinguish what nation these believers were from. And he wouldn't be able to say, hey, Israel was provoked to jealousy by another nation. And look at this, verse 20 of chapter 11. True, by their unbelief they were broken off. Israel's unbelief, and you stand by your faith. Isn't this what Paul has been saying all along? The Israelites were rejected because they didn't have faith, but the Gentiles found faith in Christ. Continuing, verse 25. For I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers. There's that word brothers again. Of this mystery, so that you won't be wise in your own conceits, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Again, he calls the readers brothers, just like in chapter 8, which was addressed to the body of Christ. Look also at what he says, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Does this mean that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until enough Gentiles become Jewish proselytes? Think about it. I don't think it could possibly mean that part of Israel has been hardened until enough Gentiles become Jews, you know? The Jews have been hardened until more Gentiles become Jews, and it just doesn't make sense. But no, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Likely the full number of um, Gentiles to come to faith in the Lord Jesus. And the last bit of the chapter, going into chapter 12 also, Chapter 11, verse 28. Concerning the good news, they, that is Israel, are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, that's God's choice, they are beloved for the Father's sake, the patriarchs. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. But as you in time past were disobedient to God, but now have obtained mercy by their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that by the mercy shown to you, they may also obtain mercy. For God is bound all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past tracing out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Isaiah 40. Or who has first given to him, and it will be repaid to him again? Job 41. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God.
I put this long section up so you can see the transition from one chapter to the next. According to Scott, once we reach chapter 12, we're back into the part of Romans that applies to us. But do you see a contrast at all? I certainly don't. If anything, Paul uses the last bit of his argument from chapter 11, the argument which he's been building in chapters 9 through 11, to lead to the therefore in chapter 12. And who is the therefore addressed to? It's the same people it's been addressed to the whole time. Brothers. Us. But let's go back to the beginning of this quoted section. What does he say? He says the people of Israel are enemies of the good news, the gospel. He says that the Gentiles have obtained mercy because of Israel's disobedience. Everyone is now guilty before God, so God can have mercy on everyone. What a God. So what is our response? Become Jewish proselytes? No. Because of God's mercy, we should offer our bodies to God, not being conformed to this world, but transformed by renewing our minds. Again, this is not an attack on Scott. As far as I'm aware, he's a brother. And I know I've had my head in the wrong thinking on a number of occasions. And unfortunately, I think Scott is deceived regarding this issue. I think he's let his theological assumptions lead him away from a clear, plain meaning of the text, and it's sad. But I can see how he got there, and this is not a bash of any sort, but I just thought I would offer these comments, these thoughts, in case maybe Scott hears them or someone else hears them, and just get a clear meaning of the text again. So I hope this is helpful, and again, nobody's fighting anybody. This is not a salvation issue. This is nothing uh, to cause division about, but just striving for more unity in the body. Anyway, I love you all. Have a blessed day. May God and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, give you his favor and his peace. Amen.